I'm Diego Cordovez. Adam Schauenfeld. Welcome to The Scoop, brought to you by Full Tilt Poker. Last week we had Tom McAvoy, old school legend, important figure in uh, poker history. Very in important. Of poker history. And uh, he's had a lot of interesting things to tell us, so we're going to continue with part two. And uh, if you missed part one, it's on Card Player TV, and uh, make sure to check it out. So oh, my one big score is also somewhat uh, deluded because there's a guy who's no longer alive that haven't had a piece of me in the um, limit holding that I won, mm -hmm. and he kept asking, "Come on, Tom, let's do a satellite, you know, one table." Right. All right. So I said, "Okay, we'll go 50-50 on a, on a one table," because I really wanted to play the main event. Of course, event. yeah. And so. But even though you'd won the limit hold'em bracelet. It wasn't a guarantee you were going to play in the main event. No, I wasn't going to. Which is unheard of these days, you know. I wasn't going to put up 10,000. Right. You know, I had pieces out on the uh, Limit Hold'em that won, so I'd won 60-something, you know, yeah. which is a nice chunk of change when right. I didn't have hardly anything going in, you know, but I'm not going to put up 10 of that. Right, right. So I'm on the satellite list. And I see Johnny Chan's name is on the list. Right. Now this was before Chan became famous, but I knew what kind of a player he was. Right. And I was, uh, you know, kind of casual friends with him at the time. So I, I, he was playing in the cash game, and I walked up to him. I said, Johnny, I said, um, I'm on the same satellite list as you are, but I said I really would rather not play against you. I mm -hmm. said. If if you want to play the next satellite, that I said I'll take a different one. But if you don't, then I'll play this one. He said, right. "Go ahead." So now I'm <clears throat> before it starts. Uh, at the time, I was still on speaking terms with Skolansky. It's <laughs> 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 no longer the case, but we were looking at that anyway. I I handicapped the satellite. Um, I don't know if you remember Jimmy Dolman. He's passed yeah. away, but. Yeah. But I thought Dolman and Sklansky were the two best players in the satellite, so I said to each of them separately, I said, um, if one of us won the satellite, why don't we trade 5%? Right. And they both agreed. Got down to three players, and it was me, Dolman, and Sklansky. <laughs> yeah. right. And Sklansky had the lead, and, and uh, I was second, Dolman was kind of a different third. So now at this point, guess who comes over the table? Right, Johnny Chan. Johnny Chan. Yeah. And he sees the, the chip situation, he sees I'm trailing, but he also had heard that it was my dream to be in this tournament. So he says, okay, Tom, he says, I'll offer you $1,000 for 20% of your action. Mm -hmm. Now, I hadn't even won the satellite, and I wasn't even the chip leader. Right, you're in third place. So I, well, I, second place. I was in oh, second. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I was in second. So I, I talked to my other partner, I said, uh, look, go. Uh, Said, I think we ought to take this, you know, because you know, if I lose, then we can get another, another shot. Yeah. Take another shot. Okay, so because your equity was probably over twenty percent, but at least you get the insurance. Oh yeah, return. yeah. I thought it was. I've noticed a trend of Johnny Chan getting the best of it on two transactions <laughs> <laughs> and having both finalists. Oh, on the yeah, this is unbelievable. It, it, it gets better. So he. <laughs> <laughs> so don't want bust out. Pretty quick after that, and I get hit up with Glancy. He's got the lead, but I trap him uh, on a pot and um, beat him. So I, I win the satellite. All right, so now Chan has 20% of me, 20% of hot beat. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I traded 1% with two other guys, Don Williams, who um, the world's best unknown player. He's right. so unknown that he's not around anymore. <laughs> right. And a guy by the name of Alan Elrod, I don't know if you remember Alan, but mm -hmm. he's not around anymore either. I mean, he's alive, but he just... You know, not in the way. poker scene. Yeah. So I went from half of myself to like a third of myself by the time right. the smoke cleared. So now we get it to the final day, and Rod Pete's got a big chip lead. Doyle Brunson is second. By the way, that was the last time Doyle Brunson made the last table and made it right. Event. And I was sitting third with 117,000 chips. Rod Pete had over triple that, and Doyle had over double that. So mm -hmm. I was way behind them. But the next guy, I was uh, was in like in the 80s or so. Right. You know, so I, I was a solid third. And they, they put up a betting line, and they made Doyle the favorite, of course, and they yeah. made me like 
eight to one against. <laughs> it was only nine in the tournament, <laughs> nine inside. Right. You know, and I had played more tournaments than anybody at that table, yeah. including Doyle and Rod and all those guys. Maybe more than anyone in the world, really. At that point, yeah. yeah. Don't forget, there was very few tournaments that I've yeah. been playing every tournament I could find around town. So I didn't have as much no limit experience as Doyle, but I'd had more tournament experience. Mm -hmm. So anyways, uh, we get down three-handed and Doyle makes a big bluff against Rod Pete and gets called a semi-bluff, you know, mm -hmm. top pair of the flush draw is up against the set, so mm -hmm. he way over bet the pot trying to run over Rod, right. well, he tough to run over set, so of yeah. course he didn't know that right had a set. So now we get heads up. And the irony is before the tournament started, Mickey Appleman went to Johnny Chan and offered to buy his interest out in both me and Rod, mm -hmm. and but he wanted assurances that there would be no tax implications, right. <laughs> which Johnny Chan <laughs> couldn't get. <laughs> <laughs> so now, <laughs> so now you know Doyle's make deals, so there's no deal uh, and until I get heads up with Rod. We make a save, but it doesn't matter to Johnny since he's got. To yeah. <laughs> Johnny was happy. He made, he made more than like either one of us made. Of course, and, and once Doyle was like that, he was he was so, golden. And when I made the I made a deal with Rod, he had me about three to two on the chip count. I made a deal that favored him, but I also knew he by this time Rod only had about a third of himself, so it didn't matter dollar wise. If he lost the tournament, he'd be getting about the same amount I did. Right. But I knew how important it was to win that tournament, more right. so than Rod did. Rod, right. at that time, he admitted later he thought it was just another tournament. Right. Well, it wasn't just he another tournament. He didn't plan tournament. on writing books and, uh, no, and he, so forth like you did. Now, Rod, Rod, if he had won, um, I think he would have probably faded away like some of the other uh, World Series winners mm -hmm. did. I mean, how many people have heard of? Mansur, Matt Luby, or Hamid Dashmalchi, and these are still pretty good players, but yeah. they're gone. But they weren't yeah. interested in promoting the themselves no. and so forth. Yeah. Well, Diego and I talk about this because we follow the history of the World Series of Poker very closely, but no, very few people do. Like, you know, we say the kids that we run into, they, you know, they don't really yeah, they don't know who Mansur are. No, no, any, anything more than five or six years ago. It's like ancient history to them. Right. You know, I, I, I know all the World Series winners in order, and. Yeah. Uh, Pretty well remember all the runners. We do too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. One thing that's that's interesting is, you know, as as Adam alluded to, you were the first champion who had gotten in on a satellite, and the introduction of the satellites was really the biggest fuel to the to the main event. Obviously, later on, the internet and TV, Until TV and the internet. created the explosion. But the growth from six people or thirteen people up to at least a hundred, a couple of hundred. Was because of satellites, and sure. you know they had then the super satellites, and I remember reading, and I thought it was funny because, just given how beneficial this is just to poker in general, a lot of these guys, back in the early '80s when the satellites first came in, and, and Tom won after winning, they were of the mind that if you want to play in the main event, you should have to put up the whole ten thousand. Getting on a satellite is is now there, there was debate about the satellite. The whole thing, right? <laughs> and instead of looking at this as this is a way to to expand the field, right. bring in a lot of players who, for the most part, aren't going to be as good players, the mentality was, you know, this is kind of our club, and if you're not a, a high roller, you know, we don't we don't want another uh, door into this. Uh, this club. That's that's incredible to me. <laughs> Did you ever sense that kind of uh, feeling? I've, I've seen people talk about that. I don't know whether they really uh, manifested well, it. since I was kind of like one of the outsiders, I, uh, you're you an know, outsider anyway. <laughs> I still am to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't really kind of. You were in that meeting. Yeah. I wasn't <laughs> in the meeting, right. But but you bring up one thing, which is, with the exception of Doyle, who. Was kind of the king of poker. There were a lot of, you know, when you look back at the guys from the 80s, early 90s, a lot of them have faded away. Uh, even the ones who've had poker accomplishments, but they've faded away in terms of just their their celebrityhood. And you've maintained it. You've written the books, and you've been very visible with, with poker stars and and uh, media. Was it always kind of your plan? Did you always think of poker as a vehicle for? 
something something bigger in terms of your own career and your own fame? Well, I knew that when I moved to Las Vegas and uh, found out I could make a living playing poker, a uh, combination of the cash games, I still made money off cash mm -hmm. games too in the tournaments, that you know this was where my new career was. You know, I, I had worked as an accountant for 12 years out of college. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a good accountant, but you know that's not exactly the most uh, exciting profession in the world. Mm -hmm. And I really like the challenge of poker and uh, to be able to make it as a player. And back then there was a lot fewer games to choose from. Mm -hmm. So if you could make it in Vegas, you could make it anywhere yeah. in the poker world. And that's kind of what I was able to do. So I had looked upon poker already as a career. At the time I won the World Series, I'd been uh, living in Las Vegas for four years and uh, been a full-time player mm -hmm. the whole time. I had had like what you call a regular job. Right. You know. uh, when I moved out to Las Vegas, uh, my intent was to make it as a player, but if I couldn't, well, you know, businesses need accountants, and I was always prepared to go back to work, but fortunately that never happened. <laughs> And the, the funny thing is, I told people when I came out, before I'd even moved out, and they thought I was crazy. I yep. said, within five years, I said, you wait and see. I will be playing. I didn't say I'd win it. I said, All I right. will be playing in the World Series main event. And when I moved out there in 79, and they thought I was crazy. So I mean, they, he says, McAvoy, and I, I remember I came in uh, July, of 79, I moved the whole family, um, three kids, a wife, uh, five cats, and <laughs> U-Haul trailers in Vegas right. or bust. Right. And they said, McAvoy, you'll be back in Michigan by Christmas. I mean, this is the There's thing. a little incentive. I, I mean, oh, yeah. now, if you told someone, you know, that you were leaving, Some, if a professional said, I'm gonna go play professional right. poker, at least the public has a consciousness that that's something that can be done. Yeah. But back then, they were probably ready to check you into the, to the loony bin. Of course. Yeah. Of course. My own parents and with thought good I reason was reason a lot of guys. Your parents, yeah. Oh, yeah, and my, and my friends, and um, virtually to a man, they thought I'd lost my sanity, <laughs> of course. <laughs> this is the thing also that, that is fascinating, which is that these days, the transition into being a professional poker player can be just a very soft one where you never have to declare I'm going to be a professional poker player. You're playing on the internet, and if you're winning, then you play more. And, and you can play anywhere lot, in the world. And you right. stop doing whatever else you felt you had to do. But it was a leap of faith in your day. I mean, oh, as you yeah. just described, I mean, you're living in Michigan. You're, you can't make a living playing poker in Michigan. So you've got to convince your wife that it's worth packing up the stuff taking the three kids, moving oh, to Las yeah. Vegas. I mean, that's something you've that I didn't quit. think about. You've got you're a family quit. man. Yeah. yeah, you've got to quit your job, you know, and so there's well, no security. Well, I'd have to quit if they fired me. <laughs> <laughs> that, that helps. Oh, right. That makes it easier. <laughs> you've got to figure out a way to get fired. <laughs> but, uh, but, I mean, there you're really putting all your eggs in one basket. As you said, you can always go back to, to working or doing, but, but it's a full commitment. There's no, well... I'm going to play a few more hours, and I'm going to play on the weekend, see how I do, and if I build up a big bankroll now, you know, it's really a, and, and a whole different thing. And having that longevity is very notable, because as you mentioned, there are guys that have won the main event that you don't really hear about anymore or don't see that much, but you have been in the poker consciousness for almost 30 years now, yeah. and that's, that's something. That's a tremendous yeah. uh, achievement, I mean, just the uh, to endure as the <laughs> errors have changed dramatically, because you know, when you made your uh, your rise, it was just a whole whole different world as we've described. I mean, there's already been several generations uh, since then in, oh, in yeah. poker terms. Well, as Adam said, much respect to you because uh, the test of time is the ultimate test. We've all we've a lot of young guys. We ask them, "Are you going to be playing poker in five years or ten years?" And a lot of them already say, "Probably not." And a lot of them, even if they think they will, they won't be. They, they won't be <laughs> for one. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, you know, to stand the test of time in this game, especially before there was the internet and, and all the growth, uh, takes a lot of, uh, of accomplishment, a lot of uh, endurance. So Thank you. I remember when I started to play, I read Tom's book. And, Me too. Uh, you know, it was, it was the only book, literally, yeah. about tournaments. So it's a pleasure having you and uh, talking about the, uh, 
early days that people may not fully appreciate. <laughs> Thanks for coming out with us, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for joining us on The Scoop, brought to you by Full Tilt Poker. Write to us at thescoop at cardplayer.com. Two bracelets. Awesome. Well, you, you know, these aren't easy to win. I remember this one like it was yesterday. My opponent had me down to my left. Sorry. Anyway, it's down to my last few chips. So, I had to call. We play at FullTailPoker.com.